This is a lecture on the history of sky writing. Mine, I am the sky. And here follows a brief history of my life as a writer. Preface. At first, I wrote only for myself. Nothing else existed. In the uncounted millennia before the Big Bang, when I was a riot of atmospheres and inexplicable non-gravitational intensities, before the creation of galaxies or cherry trees or rational thought, before the creation of creation, I kept a few notes. I can't call it a diary because day as such did not yet exist, but it had the same solipsistic purpose to prevent the moments of my own life from being allowed to waste away like a tap left running. As Virginia Woolf put it on page 239 of volume one of her somewhat later contribution to the same genre. Of course, taps as such did not yet exist either, but I'm trying to give an impression of a tendency to self-reproach that I shared with Mrs. Woolf from the beginning. We writers feel the burden of being a subject in process, no matter who we are. Footnote one. Linear time, a human and mortal invention, makes no sense to me. It goes without saying, insofar as I have always existed and probably will. But I recognize that humans, you, find a temporal framework helpful in grasping larger ideas, so let's pretend that the eras of my development as a writer succeeded one another as days of the week on a sort of biblical model, with the modification that on the seventh day, rather than resting, I came here. <laughs> Monday. On Monday, I had innumerable girlfriends and a few boyfriends and wrote up lists of these with capsule biographies and ratings on a scale of one to 10. Also a fair number of sonnets. The universe was expanding, redshift by redshift. Most of my paramours were chunks of frozen rock, miniature suns, minor moons, dwarf planets. I struggled with a few passionate asteroids, but in general avoided asteroids as being too small to get hold of. I was a super hot, super dense young sky, and I liked a good bit of rebound, especially against the cosmic microwave background of that first day of my, so to speak, autobiographical week. It was a rubbery time, nothing nailed down, emotions oscillating like crazy, Every desire broke me open in a dawn of Tiepolo pink. Yet, I have to say, I was never more physically fit. Due to the level of G-force pressure experienced during cosmogonic workouts, I could chart hourly improvements in bone density, lymphatic drainage, and overall mood. Sex was my angel of reality on Monday, better than bowling or daily aspirin. I did not worry about being exhausted by Tuesday. But then, late Monday night, a certain alchemini broke my heart and I had to pause. Alchemini was a nymph of Argos with light brown hair. She was unusually tall. I'm speaking metaphorically, there were no nymphs or light brown hair or tall or short at the time. There was hydrogen, there was helium, there were nuclei interreacting in an atmosphere of persistent radio noise at a temperature slightly above absolute zero. But a nymph makes a good story and given the pace of activity on Monday, I had to fall back on narrative cliché. So, during that era of my unbridled panspermia and serial fireball fusions, I was coupling with nymphs and engendering heavy elements all over the universe. I kept a list, as I said, and Alkmini was number 1,408. 
I saw no reason why my 1,408th nuclear interreaction should be any different than the previous 1,407, but there you go, the heart has its reasons which reason knoweth not. As someone once said, it was Pascal. I liked Alcmini much too much. She liked me not at all. Technically, she was already married, had stopped expanding her galaxies, but I was undaunted. She told me she found me an inelegant solution to a non-essential problem. And in fact, the night I had my way with her, she went immediately down the hall and had sex with her husband. The result of this three-angled sex act was Heracles, a creature in whom matter decoupled from light. Born with a twofold nature, half mortal, half immortal, not a single incandescent clarity existing everywhere at once like me, Heracles was a thing of ordinary substance, a thing with specific life and limits in space and time. In other words, he had to die. Christopher Hitchens once said to me that having a child is like your own heart walking around in another body. So there went my own heart walking towards its own death. Every millennium, every hour, closer. I could not bear this. I decided to make a deal with the laws of physics. Or maybe it was the laws of metaphysics. I get them confused. Anyway, we all agreed that if Heracles were to set himself on fire and burn to death, his finite human nature could be purged away in the flames and leave the infinite part, the part like me, there. I thought this a clever solution. Unfortunately, I overlooked the essence of death as an event. It happens in time. For a mortal creature, death is instantaneous. You're alive one minute, you're dead the next. But for a creature who exists like myself, outside time, death has no instant. I have no instant. I am at all times. I have to watch my most beloved child burn to death at all times. And I always will. Monday is the day I learned not to make deals with the man. Tuesday. Tuesday I became clouds. Possibly a defensive measure. Everyone likes clouds. They lift the heart, they lift the eye. Actually, they lift the heart because they lift the eye. Cognitive scientists say that people place gods in the high blue sky because looking up causes a rush of dopamine in the brain. Yet clouds do more than draw your eye upwards. They invent your imagination. This happens on a small scale when you lie on your back on a hill on a summer day gazing up and saying, <clears throat> oh look, that one's a camel. There's Werner Herzog, a can opener, the Taj Mahal. The interpretation and reinterpretation of shifting shapes of cloud is one of the most basic exercises in free imagining known to you dwellers upon the earth, also useful for reminding you that most of the ideas you conceive about the world are fragmentary, fugitive, self-ruining, and soon forgotten. However, when I, the sky, talk within the framework of my autobiography as a writer about inventing the imagination, I mean something else. For a while, during the so-called Enlightenment era, when human beings in general, especially highbrow middle-class Europeans, were so gripped by rationalism and so besotted with notions of intellectual control that natural science lectures offered on topics from hydraulics, magnetics, and mathematics to volcanoes and the operations of the human heart were attended by hundreds of people. During that, as I say, tender-minded era, 
I made myself available to analysis. I gave them to believe that I, the clouds, could be reduced to a typology. It was hard work. I had to replace the shapeless caprice of my atmospheres with four basic cloud types. I had to edit the indecipherably fluid filigree of my language into a dry-as-dust classificatory system replete with Latin terminology. And beyond that, I had to be flirtatious. If you bring a concept or category up close enough to the human mind to be very, very attractive, and then whisk it away so it stays out of reach, it becomes erotic. Flirting is not in my nature, but who would be bothered doing science if it weren't erotic? The four basic cloud types. As defined by amateur nephologist Mr. Luke Howard in a lecture at Plough Court, London on 10th December 1802 are Cirrus, Cumulus, Stratus, and Nimbus. Cirrus from the Latin for lock of hair, means a tendril or fibrous shape. Cumulus, from the Latin for heap or pile, means a heap or pile. Stratus, from the Latin for layer, is a horizontal band, and nimbus, Latin cloud, a rainy combination of all three previous types. It was, let me repeat, hard work to dash about the universe impersonating these four cloud formations, not to mention the ceaseless transitions between them with their seductive lacy gaps. And to keep this up day and night for years until Mr. Luke Howard gathered enough data for his taxonomy. It was an athletic time for me. I had to practice a lot. And the tricky thing about practicing if you're the sky is there's nowhere to go to be alone. You are already everywhere. I won't burden you with the solution I found for this. It involves string theory and we haven't got to that day of the week yet. <laughs> Mr. Luke Howard's taxonomy of clouds was just one small component of the scientization of all things that began with Descartes and has shaped the mess in which the present world finds itself. Still, I am perversely proud to have been a part of it, insofar as my contribution was a work of fiction and ought to have subverted the whole taxonomic process. I admit I was surprised when reason with a capital R prevailed, and from this I learn never to be surprised when reason prevails especially if its data are imaginary. At the same time, the experience refreshed and refocused my own creative process. Let me quote here John Cage, something has to be done to get us free of our memories and choices. Wednesday. Exhausted with hauling myself around the upper air in cloud masquerade, I decided on Wednesday to sit at my desk, use the telephone, and do an interview. I interviewed pebbles and small rocks. Insofar as I have, so to speak, all the time in the world, I could interview all the pebbles and small rocks in the world simultaneously. Even so, it was a quiet experience. The questions were formulated as a sort of quiz. Here is a precis of the most interesting answers that the pebbles and small rocks gave to my questions. Pay attention. One, smoothness. Two, the crumbine phi scale of sedimentology. Three, Mars. Four, golf on Mars. Five, put up signs expressing state of mind. For example, yes, I love you, help. My questions had been concerned with the following areas, respectively. One, criteria for racial or class prejudice in your community. Two, a better way to judge the National Book Awards. Three, favorite vacation spot. 
Four, favorite vacation activity. Five, what you would do first if you had hands. Well, the Pebbles and Small Rocks interview didn't even take all morning, so after lunch I picked up the telephone again and called that gentleman everyone was waiting for in the latter part of the 20th century. Here is a transcription of our chat. First things first, do I call you Godot or Godot? Why not use my first name? Okay, what's that? Rusty. So, Rusty, tell me, how did it all get started, the non-arriving? Uh, started in a thinness. That sort of thinness. Thinness like that plate you climb back up over from behind when waking from a very flat dream. Any narrative trajectory? Keep moving at all times. Avoid touching the hole at the center of this thinness. What's the hole for? Discourage snooping. Any music? Oh, a honky-tonk sort of thing, mostly percussion. I didn't like it. I didn't do the music. What about lighting? Floodlights. Oh, rusty, how exhausting. Yes, exhausting, not to say boring. I would have been monumentally bored had I not met Yoko Ono, who gave me a few suggestions for passing the time. Like, for example? Like, for example, send a note of appreciation to silent, courageous people you bump into. Metal workers, mothers, sweet street sweepers, etc. Keep doing it. See what happens. That might be a good note to end on. Faintly redemptive. But listen, Mr. Skye. I have quite a few anecdotes left. You know, Rusty, it's been a hard morning for me. How so? I've been trying to get a few sound bites out of the pebbles and small rocks. Ah, uh, pebbles and small rocks. Say no more. You know them? Mr. B auditioned a whole bunch of pebbles and small rocks before he hired me. One can see why. Oh, sure, good looks, natural talent, but no method. No sense of elsewhere. Pebbles and small rocks just don't know how to bring it up from inside. Did you enjoy working with him? Oh, God, no. What a monster. If we asked him questions about text, he'd warn us to be on guard against committing reason. Sounds like John Cage. Oh, a much harsher man than Cage. Build a little kingdom, then shit on it, he would say. I am familiar with that impulse. Well, time for my afternoon nap. Goodbye, Mr. Skye. Thank you, Rusty. It's been a consoling hour. Thursday. Maybe because Wednesday had been a good day, almost Proustian, I made the mistake on Thursday of attempting to write a memoir of childhood and all but vanished into its vortex of prehistoric pain. There were mountains piled on mountains, mothers frustrated, fathers castrated, brothers and sisters driven down to hell, the usual family horror, and disputes about who gets to use the car. I won't bore you. I drew a big X through the manuscript, deleted it from the computer, and sent a note to Yoko Ono. Footnote 2. <clears throat> Memoir writing was, for me, a process that entailed long periods of silent reflection during which I tried to keep my mind motionless and my eyes downcast. Here is my favorite thing to look at with eyes downcast. Forest shade, lake shade, poplar shade, highway shade, backyard shade, cafe shade, down behind the high school shade, Cow shade, carport shade, blowing shade, dappled shade, shade darkened by rain above, shade under ships, shade along banks of snow, shade beneath the one tree in a bright place, shade by the ice cream truck, shade in the new car sales room, shade in halls of the palace as all the electric lights turn on, shade in a stairwell, shade in tea barrels, shade in books, 
Shade of clouds running over a distant landscape. Shade on bales in the barn. Shade in the pantry. Shade in the ice house. The smell of shade. Shade under runner blades. Shade along branches. Shade at night. A difficult research. Shade on rungs of a ladder. Shade on pats of butter sculpted to look like scallop shells. Shade to holler from. Shade in the chill of bamboo. Shade at the core of an apple. Confessional shade. Shade of hair salons. Shade in a joke. Shade in the town hall. Shade descending from legendary ancient hills. Shade under the jaws of a dog with a bird in its mouth trotting along to the master's voice. Shade at the back of the choir. Shade in pleats. Shade clinging to arrows in the quiver. Shade in scars. Footnote three. Meditating on shade led me to ponder absent presence in general and to begin to worry about those many sky-related questions which will undoubtedly remain unanswered when this lecture is over. For example, is the sky blue? Is the sky round? Is it proper to use the informal second person singular pronoun tu or toi when addressing the sky? Do hawks and falcons look so fantastic rising and falling because they have the sky as background? Or would they look equally good flying through mud or a piece of corduroy? Ontologically speaking, is the sky something or merely what is left over because everything else has edges? Can the sky break? If it broke, could it be built again? If built again, would it change its ways? Is there one sky or many? If many, do they know about each other or wonder? Are there some outcast skies? Is it true the question mark derives from the shape of the tail of a cat when surprised? Sorry, unfair question. Here's another. If a scholar of the Rig Veda went to a Chinese restaurant, what would his fortune cookie say? Answer, congratulations, you love Chinese food. But not four. Now that we are so well embarked on footnotes, which have their own sort of sluggish energy, here's four minutes of deleted material from Wednesday's interview with Rusty. <laughs> what did your father do? Cows. How many cows? Oh, five or six. Did you help with the cows? Every day, down to the river we went. What were those days like? Long. What'd you do? Talk to them. Talk to the cows? No, mostly the plants. I studied all the plants, tasted all the plants, talked to all the plants and introduced them to one another. Why talk to the plants, not to the cows? Plants know how to listen. Cows don't. Cows are crazy, especially ours. Ours never got enough to eat. People think cows are fat and peaceful, but those are government cows. Government buses those cows ahead anywhere there's going to be a photo op. Those are the cows that show up on TV living the good life. But ours were scrawny and terrible, ran all over the place. Still, those cow herding days must have been good training for you, for the non-arriving. I guess. Seems to me that although waiting is hard, especially waiting for something never arrives, never arriving is hard too and has just about as much waiting in it. Well, I've got a talent for it. Me too, actually. Being the sky involves a fair amount of just hanging there. Oh, it's very different. Different how? Well, one thing I have to keep out of sight. But then also, and this is a factor very few people appreciate about my work, non-arriving isn't one big simple thing. It's different every time, every case unique. It's tricky layered psychological work. Analogies like web and maze come to mind. A long, painful, undirected intimacy between strangers with no common goal. Ideally, I make a slow appeal to feelings unexpressed and end up by drawing tears from a stone. Sounds like the secret police? 
It's a piss load of research gone into all this. But here's a question. Here's a question I've been curious about for years, Rusty. Let's have it. Why do you never arrive? I know it's your job, your assignment, your role in the play, but tell me the truth. Isn't there something deeper going on? Like what? Like bearing witness to the atrocities of our time? Nope. Really? Never gave a fart for atrocities. You're not calling history to account? You're not using silence to speak louder than words or put us all in the rearview mirror of our mean and ending world? Nope. And we should draw no apocalyptic conclusions whatsoever from your steely reticence. You know what? Every October I rake apocalyptic conclusions into a pile in the backyard and burn them. To you? But I suspect we've lost track of your original question. Which was, why don't you arrive? Why don't I arrive? Yes. Okay, I'll give you an answer, but you won't like it. And you'll say, we can't end there. Shoot. Who told me this was my Uncle Roy? I liked Uncle Roy, a little short man full of fantastic alibis. He worked for the State Department a long time, then made a fortune by inventing the You Are Here map for public spaces. You know, the big map and the parks and metro stops. Well, the thing is, the You Are Here map is, by the time it's been about a year, a year and a half, the U is entirely rubbed off. No kidding. So says Uncle Roy. They rub it right off. Because everybody wants to touch the U when they're lost. Aw. It has to be painted back on. I suppose it would. That's one guy's entire job all day, to go around repainting second-person pronouns on You Are Here maps. What about the red dot? Well, the fact is, the red dot doesn't usually disappear. It's just the U. Haunting. Different kind of paint. Oh. So, let me ask you a question now. Okay. How do you think the interview went? Our interview? Yes. You're the expert. I'm just an amateur. And I like to know how other people go about their craft. Well, to be honest, Rusty, I was a little disappointed in my own performance. In the sense that whenever I listen to interviews on the radio, they get in at least once and usually several times the question, and how did that make you feel? But with you, I didn't find any place to work it in. Hmm. I'll tell you what. I'll ask you that question. Just out of blue? No, I'll give you a context. Here, let's say it's dusk in America. You're not the sky anymore. You're some traveling salesman driving along the freeway. And you pass one of those suburban, what do you call it, housing developments with a lot of little houses all the same. And a big billboard that says, if you lived here, you'd already be home. How does that make you feel? Wow, Rusty, what a great question. I have to think about that one. Take your time. Hmm. Well, it makes me sad then happy, happy then sad. And here I'll quote Proust, who was, with that weird devious moral power of his, able to capture in words so perfectly this quintessential experience of all the creeping creatures that creep upon the earth. Quote, and so it was from the Garamond way that I learned to distinguish those states of mind that follow one another in me during certain periods, and that even go so far as to divide up each day among them, one returning to drive away the other with the punctuality of a fever, contiguous, but so exterior to one another, so lacking in means of communication among them, that I can no longer understand, no longer even picture to myself in the, in the end what I desired in the one or feared or accomplished in the other. That was Swan's Way, translated by Lydia Davis. I like it. Me too. End of footnote four, back to the lecture.
Friday. On Friday, I decided to delegate. Why do all this thankless work writing if I can hire a ghost? So for a while, I experimented with so-called sky writers, sky typers, and sky dot matrix printers. There are aeronautical experts who perform all these media in little airplanes that exude picturesque white smoke. I have to say I was disappointed in the level of invention overall. I had envisioned epic poems in hexameter verse arcing across the heavens from Patagonia to Paris. I got I love you Doris and ads for lucky strike. But halfway through Friday, I realized I was on the wrong track. I was looking to the public for what could only be private. I had to step back from the marketplace to the inside of the mind. That's when I became a Hindu, or at least very deeply interested in what Hindu scholars of the Rig Veda mean by writing. The hymns of the Rig Veda contain the following suggestion, quote, Something only exists if consciousness perceives it as existing. And if a consciousness perceives it, within this consciousness there must be another consciousness perceiving the consciousness that perceives, and so forth. You can pursue this regress in an inward direction, as Vedic scholars do, or you can go the other way and find sky upon sky upon sky, perceiving all the degrees of consciousness in the cosmos. You need to take a breath to think this, and your breath is the thinking. We think each other back and forth, your mind and me. We write one another. Put this a different way. Consciousness and sky, or mind and cosmos, are organically related. They mirror and enact one another. The Vedic scholars whose care was to transmit those thousands of hymns and ritual directives and meditations that comprise the Rig Veda did so for three millennia by oral tradition without writing down a single word because they saw the texts inscribed in their minds. Of course they had to pay attention and for the most part they were fantastically scrupulous both in reading these inward texts and in performing the rituals prescribed by them. But a wonderful and forgiving aspect of Hindu thought, to me at least, is the notion they had that if someone did make a mistake in a ritual, a witness who noticed the error and who knew the correct text could mend the mistake on the sky of his mind and so make the cosmos perfect again micro physically. I spent the rest of Friday noticing various acts of mending going on throughout the cosmos here and there. I felt calm and hopeful. Then about 12 o'clock my mood changed. I'm not sure why. It was midnight, but darker. Saturday. تيقطت يوم السبت متضارب الأفكار وأدركت بخبرتي الشخصية أن هناك منطقة هائلة ما زالت غير مفسرة وغير مستكشفة أن السماء كوسيلة للإبادة الحرب هي إحدى حقائق الحياة لكل المخلوقات الزاحفة التي تزحف على الأرض كما يصفها سفر التكوين في اليوم السادس والحرب على الأغلب هي تاريخ لأشياء طيارة قاتلة رصاص قنابل أقواس رماح لياقات الكبيرة الفرقة بـ 52 السهام السامة الغازات السامة الأسلحة النووية المحمولة المدافع الطائرات بدون طيار الفتاكة دفعتني غريزة الأولى إلى تدوين ذلك كله في رواية, جريئة جري... في رواية جريمة سريعة الإيقاع لقد وقعت جرائم بالتأكيد اكتشفت استحالة وضع ذلك العمل الشرير الطويل في جبرية بسيطة تربط بين السبب والنتيجة جرائم الخيال مكثفة دوما 
تأثيرها على الجاري يكمن في تجسيد أوجه مكوناتها الجبرية الضحية المجرم المحقق الخير الشر أما الحرب فقد تعاظمت حتى أصبحت بلا وجه عبر تاريخها بلا ريب فقد نظر كل من هكتور وأخيل إلى عيني أحدهم إلى عيني أحدهم الآخر في ميدان المعركة ولكن في 1092 وجد البابا أوربان الثاني ضرورة في تحريم القوس والنشاب ذلك بسبب بعد المسافة بين القاتل والضحية وفي القرن العشر الحادي والعشرين بكبسة زر واحدة يستطيع جندي في ولاية نيفادا قتل أو إحراق خمسة في الباكستان تقول فكرة قديمة بدون وجه لا توجد أخلاق لكن بدون وجه أيضا لا عمل لي لا شيء ليكتب عنه لا أحد يستطيع بنا جملة باستعمال الأفعال فقط ولا أحد قادر على قصة على سرد قصة دون أن يؤمن بحقيقة الآخرين وبعد أنا لم أتوقع منك أيتها المخلوقات الزاحفة يا من تزحفون على الأرض أن تكفوا عن رغبتكم في الحرب في وقت قريب وأنا لم أتوقع ولا نتوقف عن إيصال رغباتكم الهستيرية عبر أثيري الأزرق هذا ما نحن عليه Saturday was the day to acknowledge this Saturday. Saturday I awoke conflicted, for I realized, autobiographically speaking, that there remained one vast area of self-experience as yet unexplored and unexplained, namely sky as a medium of annihilation. Warfare is a fact of life for all the creeping creatures that creep upon the earth, as the book of Genesis calls them on the sixth day. And warfare is mostly a history of death bringing stuff flying through the air. Bullets, bombs, bows and arrows, big berthas, B-52s, poison darts, poison gas, portable nukes, cannonballs, curses, lethal drones. My first instinct was to fashion all this into a fast-paced crime novel. Certainly there were crimes. But it proved impossible to condense that long evil doing into a simple algebra of cause and effect. Crime fiction is very condensed. And its impact on the reader derives from giving a face to the algebraic components. A face to the victim, a face to the criminal, a face to the detective, to the good, to the bad. Warfare has grown increasingly faceless throughout its history. Surely Hector and Achilles looked into each other's eyes on the battlefield, but in 1092, Pope Urban II found it necessary to outlaw the crossbow as being inglorious due to its distance from death. And by the 21st century, a soldier in Nevada can push a button and have five people in Pakistan burst into flame. Without the face, no ethics. This is an old idea. But also... Without the face, no function for me, nothing to write about. No one can make sentences using only verbs. No one can tell a story without believing in the reality of other people. Yet I didn't, I don't expect all you creeping creatures that creep upon the earth to stop wanting warfare any time soon. And I didn't, I don't expect me to stop delivering the hysterical valentines of your desire through my beautiful blue air. That's who we are. Saturday was the day to acknowledge this. Every writer's week arrives at a Saturday, a day when he wishes it were Monday again and he could start over with the innocence of his first sonnets. 
or even the relative rectitude of Tuesday when the Enlightenment was dawning and Immanuel Kant was writing sentences like, two things move me to wonder, the starry sky above me and the moral law within me. Those starry skies don't come back. So now it is Sunday. Creation rests, I close my notes. Like every author, when I come to the end of a piece of writing, it is quite clear to me that I will never write again. The upper air, the middle air, the lower air is blank. Blankness plunges out of it. Blankness plunges out of it and goes elsewhere. And I suppose it will arrive. The end. <laughs>